Let's pray. Bow your heads, okay? God, you are so good. Lord, we thank you that we could come to the house of God and we could declare your praises from the youngest, Lord God, to the the most seasoned saint in, in this place today. Lord, we do desire to declare your praises because you are good. Despite our circumstances, you are good. And God, I pray today as we start this new series on mission that you would help us be on assignment that you would help us have the mind of Christ, that you would help us hear what you are speaking to your church today. And God, that you would give us willing hearts to be obedient, that we would not shrink back in these troubling times. God, that instead we would rise up, Lord God, that we would put our full armor of God on, that we would go out, we would make disciples, that we would declare your praises to a dying generation who needs to hear the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Today, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, that you would give us hearts that would be of attention today, that our minds would be focused, that we would not allow any distraction to erase through our mind, our thoughts. Oh, God, that instead we would have hearts willing to be open, minds willing to to be open to what your word has to say to us today. God, that it would fall on good ground. God, that we would bear fruit, that we would receive your word and bear fruit, and that we would change, and that we would be transformed, and that we would bring the transformation to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, this message is called, if you're taking notes, I see my front row usually takes notes. My girl, Janae, she's got me. All right, so if you're taking notes, Janae, the message is called The Barnabas Way. And this is about the power of encouragement, the Barnabas Way. Before we get into the scriptures, I want to show you um, a picture of why it's so important to encourage people. This picture is an iceberg, and up above it is what we see. That's when we see someone, we're like, how you doing? And they're, they're, what do they say? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm great. I'm good. But underneath, what we can't see is help. <laughs> I'm insecure. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling angry, and I don't know why. I feel alone. I feel unworthy. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what the plan of God is on my life. I'm overwhelmed with my family. I'm lonely. I need connection. I need help. I need someone to actually see me. But those things are hidden. And that is why, friends, it's important to always give kindness to people. Because so often we react to someone else's behavior, taking it personal. But oftentimes what people are doing to what we think they're doing to us, they're not doing it to us. They're doing it for themselves. And so we have to be the people of God that see the deeper things, see the meaning behind the behavior. Amen? All right, let's get into the scripture. Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. We're starting a series called On Mission, and this series is about the church and the purposes of the church, to glorify God, to make disciples, I'm not just talking about vision church. I'm talking about the church, the called out ones, the people of God, those who know Jesus, who have been born again, who are alive in his spirit, our purpose, friends. And so we're going to be talking about this for at least six weeks because there's so much that needs to be restored onto the church, especially after most of us are coming out of isolation. Most of us are co- coming out of this, this season that not just our country, but the world has been in, and it has impacted the church. The church is weakened right now. But like Jesus told Peter, when he, after Peter failed, before Jesus ascended, after he resurrected, he went to Peter and he said, after you have been strengthened, turn and strengthen your brothers. Friends, we are in that season right now. If you are still here in church and you didn't give up on God through Corona, then it's time for you to turn and strengthen your brothers. The best way for you to get over your own funk and your own issues, friends, is sometimes turning and strengthening 
your brothers and your sisters in the Lord. The scripture says we're to edify one another, comfort each other. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, and let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. Not forsaken, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. As, mit, as some are in the manner of doing, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. This is not the time to shrink back. This is the time to come together, to encourage, to edify one another, to see the deeper things that people are going through. Don't let your own mess blind you from the, the trouble that others are going through. And so this was Barnabas. Barnabas is a great example. We, we hear about, you know, the 12 disciples. We hear about the apostles. You've probably even heard about Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But let me present this to you today. There would have been no Paul if there wasn't a Barnabas. Barnabas doesn't get a lot of the hype as some, as some other apostles and leaders of the early church like Peter and Paul. But Barnabas was a man of encouragement. The first time we really hear about Barnabas is in the book of Acts in chapter 4. And I'm going to read this to you. It says in verse 32 and 37, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Isn't that powerful? No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy person among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means Son of encouragement. Sold a field that he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. So often when we read this passage of, of, of the Bible, there are so many things that we can get from it. We talk about being of one mind and one accord. We talk about the early church had no needy person. But today from this passage, I want to focus on Barnabas. I want to focus on Barnabas. I also want to relate this to where we are today. Today, we cannot say there's no needy person among us and I'm in the church, and I'm not talking about finances, although that is relevant as well. I'm talking about the need to be seen, the need to be heard, the need to be recognized, the need to, to be validated, the need for kindness, the need for encouragement, the need for connection, that is present, not just in the church, but in the world that we live. And we need God to raise up people of encouragement again. So often it's easy to look. Pastor Josh um, shared this a few weeks ago when he preached, and he was talking about, was it Thomas Edison who was doing a math course, or was it one of the other smart guys? I knew it was one of the other smart guys, Einstein, <laughs> doing a math course to his class. And he, he did all kinds of problems right, but he purposely got one problem wrong. And that was the only thing that people responded to. And that is how it is in our human nature, to respond to our children the one time they mess up instead of all the things good that they're doing. Our kids could be out here selling drugs and, and shooting people. I mean, it's happening. You know, but we focus on the one thing that they're doing wrong instead of, instead of the 100 things they're doing right. The same as can be said about our spouse, the one thing that they're doing wrong instead of the 100 things that they're doing right. The same thing could be said about our bosses, our coworkers, our best friends, our pastors, our leaders. The one thing they're doing wrong instead of the hundreds of things that they're doing right. And friends, because of the lack of encouragement in our churches, and I'm not just talking about vision. But I'm talking about overall, among the people of God, we see needy people. You've heard of the saying, EGRs, right? If you've, if you've been here long enough, you've heard it. Let me explain for those who haven't 
heard of that. Who ha- we have a saying that, that, that Josh and I grew up with 20 plus years ago when we were young adults and, and we became um, leaders and uh, it was EGRs, meaning ex- people who are extra grace required, people who are a little bit more needy of grace because they're getting on your nerves a little bit. And the Lord showed me years later that we're all an EGR to at least somebody. There's somebody in our life that you know you're going to them a lot of times and you're a little needy. There's, maybe it's your husband. Beep, beep, beep. I'm, I'm, I go to my husband sometimes, friends, and I, and I literally do this. Beep, beep, beep. I am his EGR. And what you don't want to know what beep, beep, beep means? It means, hello, my tank is empty. I need some gas, meaning I need some attention. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. We're all beeping around somebody, friends. You just don't realize it. And if you would realize that all of us are EGRs to someone, then maybe with the same love that you're receiving from God and other people around you, you could find it in your heart to give some encouragement and some kindness to those around you. Today, friends, there, the, Mother Teresa says this, there is more hunger for love and appreciation in the world than for bread. We need people to find uh, God in every part of themselves and in the world, and we need people to see what God is doing in other people. We need people to find the Barnabas way. And so I'm going to give you, I believe today I got, do I got four? Nope, I got five characteristics that, that, Barnabas did five focuses, if you will, that he did that helped him be the son of encouragement. Number one, he was character focused, character focused. And what do I mean by that? I mean that he that that he was focused on developing his own character. We're so often worried about someone else's bad character that we're not worried about our own character. He was focused on his own character so much so, do you realize in the passage that I read that Barnabas, what was Barnabas' real name? He was just a common Joe. He was just a, he was just an everyday Joe. He was, he was just an everyday Joe, except for his character was so exemplary. His character was so above reproach. The way he treated people was so honorable that he got a nickname. The apostles looked at him and they said, no, nah, you are not an everyday Joe. You're not just a normal Joe. You are a Barnabas. You are a son of encouragement. Man, how cool is that? How cool that his nickname was because of his character. My favorite part of this story is that that Barnabas wasn't even his real name. It was just a description of who he was as a person. My question for you, what would be your nickname if your family, co-workers, church members based it on your behavior? Would it be extra joy? (laughs) Would it be laid back, Jeremy? Would it be spicy so-and-so, hothead so-and-so? Or would it be, man, that person is kind, that person is encouraging, that person is loyal, that person is faithful? Let's, Let's let that be what they're known for. Amen? So Barnabas was character focused. He first focused on his own character. Also, he was, he, there was a generosity. He was focused on generosity. He encur- his encouragement, this is the thing, friends. Encouragement does not cost money. It does not cost money to encourage somebody. But it does cost time and it does cost attention. But encouragement does not cost money. It is free to pick up your phone and to text somebody something that they're doing right. It is free to pick up your phone and text somebody a scripture verse that that God put on your heart for them. It is free to point out the one of the hundred things that your husband is doing right and speak that over him. I've learned in psychology that for every one (laughs) negative word that you speak over somebody, you need at least five positive words to replace it. I said, because I'm extra, I need like seven. (laughs) 
seven words to replace it. I've done this with my sons that I call my sons of thunder, my youngest too, because they are full of passion and I know that they're going to make an impact for the kingdom. But with them being so full of passion, they want, they, everything is a, is a competition between the two of them. And since they're not listening to me as I'm preaching right now, I'm going to tell a story about them. So just yesterday, <laughs> I thought I discovered something very amazing. It was spicy cheese. I don't even know what kind of cheese it was called, but it was spicy and cubed with grapes. Mm, I ate it, and I was like, yes, this, but not just regular cheese, but like this moderate spicy, was it? Pepper Jack. Pepper Jack, thank you, my sister. I had a piece of cube pepper jack cheese and some grape, and I tasted it, and I said, oh, this is, this is going to change your life. And I saw my youngest son, and with my youngest son, Justice, I said, Justice, taste this. It's going to change your life. This is so good. This is going to be the new snack that you're going to want. And he looked at me, and he said, <laughs> you think you made that up? I said, yes. He said, Ratatouille made that up, Mom. <laughs> and then my other son of thunder, who I didn't even know was paying attention because he was clearly in a different room playing a video game, said, Ratty too, he didn't make up grapes and cheese. He had grapes and strawberries. Or, yeah, that's what I mean, strawberries and cheese. And for like five minutes, they argued over, is it grapes and cheese or strawberries and cheese? And I'm like, I'm just trying to give you all a healthy option over here. Why are we arguing over this? I'm trying to walk out the door. I got things to do. And the Sons of Thunder went at it to come and find out that they were both right. I guess Ratty too, he just had a thing for fruit and cheese, okay? But what I've tried to tell my kids is if you say something negative over one, an one another, like, you're dumb, man. It wasn't grapes and cheese. It was strawberries and cheese. How about now replace that negative word with five positive words? <laughs> they don't always listen. But sometimes they're like, man, you're an athlete. Yeah, got good hair. <laughs> I like your shoes. <laughs> got a lot of girls on Snapchat. Like, <laughs> You did good on your project. <laughs> and it smelled decent today. <laughs> but the point of that is for every one negative thing, for every time you hear stupid or not good enough or man, you messed up here, we need to hear positive things, multiple positive things to replace that negative word. And this is proven, friends. They, they've done tests and research on this to prove that this is true. We've got to be careful on what we speak to one another. Generosity is not just about giving money. It's about giving compliments, sincere compliments. It's about seeing one another, speaking truth to one another, speaking love to one another. And you know what? It's about doing it without expecting anything in return. What was so cool is Barnabas gave this money, and he didn't give it with strings attached. He gave it generously with no strings attached, just out of the kindness of his heart. Friends, how awesome is that? So my question for you today is, what's the easiest for you to give? Is it your time? Is, your, is it your talent, maybe? Is it your treasure? And, well, conversely here, friends, what is the most difficult for you to give? What is the most difficult? Because I believe that both of those things speak something to us. Pray about that. Ask God, what is the deeper meaning for this? So Barnabas way, he was, he was focused on his character, on generosity. Friends, the scripture says he was Holy Spirit focused. Acts eleven twenty four 24 says, for he was a good man. This is Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And much people, many people was added to the Lord. The scripture actually says must. There's oftentimes that, that the grammar translated doesn't sound right in our, Eng in our English, but that's actually what the scripture says. <laughs> this is the thing. You can't give what you don't have. So often we find it, why is it so hard to encourage somebody? Because you cannot give 
what you don't have. The actual word encourage means to inspire courage for somebody. You can't inspire courage to somebody when you don't have it. You can't encourage somebody when you're discouraged. You can't uplift somebody when you feel down in the dumps, friends. And that's why it's so important to make sure we're getting what we need from God so that we can give God to other people. If you don't have a relationship with God, how are you going to share and encourage someone else to develop a relationship with God when you yourself don't have one? Somebody, come on. You can't lead people where you have not been yourself. Suppose we are to be encouragers, then we must be encouraged. In these dark and troubled times, we can't stay encouraged on our own accord. Scripture tells us Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. If we want to encourage this world, we must be full of the Holy Spirit and faith. If you are in this place and you have been in a, a place of be, feeling burnt out, you need to ask the Lord, what kind of tired am I so that you can make sure you're being filled right? And I'm going to go a little psychology on you again, okay? What kind of tired are you? Oftentimes where people don't really truly find rest, and Jesus says in his word that if you're heavy and you're burdened to what? Come to him and he will give you rest. But oftentimes, we don't realize what kind of tired we are. There's seven different kinds of tired that I want to present to you really quick here today, okay, quickly here, that have different types of rest. And this is not in my notes, and Pastor Josh didn't get to see it when he was pulling my PowerPoint because God gave it to me this morning. So number one, <laughs> this is for you, baby, physical rest. Sometimes you might be physically just tired, and therefore you need physical rest. Yesterday, I'm telling you, friends, I usually don't have this because your girl over here, she likes to get her eight hours of sleep. Some of us struggle to sleep. Others of us hit the pillow and we're, oh, that's me. I love to sleep. I, I, I like to get my rest and I like to go to bed. If only my kids would let me sleep at 10 o'clock at night when I would like to sleep, that's when they like to knock on my door. But at 10 o'clock at night is when I like to go to bed. I, my brain shuts down. I really don't have much left to give. I like my sleep, okay? Often what ha has happened in this new season of my life is because I have kids in sports and that takes up every single one of my evenings and I'm in school full time and trying to oversee two churches and have a husband who's not as needy as me but needs to give to me. So <laughs> sometimes what I find is I'm staying up past 10 o'clock at night writing papers. You told me that I was going to have that happen to me, Lydia, when I told you I was going back to school. And I said, no, nah, girl, that's all you young people. I'm going to get my work done during the day. I got flex time at my job. I can do this during the Nope. I have been up late. So I was up to like 2 o'clock in the morning on Friday night getting some work done. And I was tired on Saturday. So for me to get what I needed, I needed to go to bed earlier yesterday. If you're physically tired, the kind of rest you need is physical. But there's other kinds of rest. Maybe you are mentally tired. Maybe you need a brain break. Maybe, like me, you've, wrote, you've written three papers, and, and reading another book is just going to exhaust you. And you need a brain break. You need to do something that is like giving your brain a break. For me, that's the best time for me to clean. Because I don't really have to do a whole bunch of thinking about cleaning. I'm not really like like some expert cleaners, but hey, that's when I can run the vacuum. It don't take much brain power for me to run the vacuum. That's when I can wipe down a wall. It doesn't take much brain power for me to wipe down a wall. That's when I could switch my dishwasher out. For me, that's whatever it is for you that gives you a brain break. Maybe it's playing some like weird video game like solitary on your phone. I don't know. Is that a brain break? Some people it might be. Not me. I hate puzzles. But for someone else, maybe coloring will give you a brain break. Petting your dog. I don't know. Something that's going to give you a brain break that you don't have to think about. It's just easy to do, okay? If you find yourself mentally exhausted. Maybe you work at a job that you're always solving problems. Well, if you go home and you're trying to, like, do a puzzle, it might not be the best thing to give you rest. You need to find something else. Maybe you need social rest. And all the introverts in the house said... Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. 
<laughs> well, sometimes introverts, my husband's an introvert, they're around people, and they just need a social rest. And it's super annoying because I leave, you know, being around church or youth group, and I'm like, yeah, let's go do something. And, and he leaves, and he's like, man, I got to go home by myself. Please don't talk to me for an hour. And I'm like, no, I want more. Like, yeah, I'm pumped up, you know. But what I have realized That different people need different kinds of rest. And maybe for my husband, he needs a social rest, which means time alone. Maybe you need a spiritual rest. Maybe you have been the person that everybody in your family has been going to for prayer. um, That Everyone in your family has been going to uh, with their problems. And you need a spiritual rest. What you need is you need to make sure that you are being filled, that you have your own devotional time, that you are praying, that you are seeking God's face, that you are getting your breakthrough. For me, that means I can't just, I mean, I go through my prayers and I have prayers like in my journal. I I say the serenity prayer at least once a week. I have prayers for my family. I say the all, all, our father prayer. But then I have my time where I'm praying and I'm speaking in tongues. And, and I have to at least cry in the spirit at least once a week. It is a release for me, okay? I'm not saying you guys have to do that. But I have a lot of people pulling on me spiritually, so I have to find my spiritual rest, okay? Maybe it is a sensory rest, okay? Well, people who work in creatives, okay, and young people, I need you in the back row. I want to see every single eye back there in the back row underneath your hair. Let me see it. There it is. There it is. I see eyes. Listen, I believe I, I'm still looking for eyes who aren't looking at me. <clears throat> okay. What I mean by this sensory rest, Gen Z, is you need to put your phones down. You need to put your phones down. And not just Gen, Gen Z, younger millennials, elder millennials, Gen X. Some of you boomers are on your phones too much too. We need to put them down. Put away the iPads, and we need to give our brain a sensory rest. My girl Becca, she works um, in creative. She's always on a blue screen. She's always, like, working on something. Sometimes she needs to take a break from her phone. So I don't get offended when I text her five or six times before she texts me back. Because I know she needs a break. (laughs) She'll get to me when she needs to get to me. We need that. We need that. Okay, number six. We need emotional rest. Emotional rest. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you're that person in your family that everyone's dumping on all the time, and you're always encouraging them, you're always uplifting them, you give not just of your spirit, but you give of your emotions. And guess what? How to get emotional rest is you need to find an unbiased, safe person that you can talk to about your emotions. I I went from, in the 1990s, believing counseling was for people who were seriously mentally ill to now believing everybody needs somebody, at least at some point in their life, that they can talk through. If you haven't hit it yet, one day you probably will. And, and it's important to have an unbiased person who can hear you out, who's not going to be judgmental, that you can release. I am so grateful for the counselor that I have in my life that I could talk to. You know what she told me one day, friends? She wouldn't tell you this because legally she's not allowed to, but I can. She told me, you could come to me and you could complain about every single one of your church members and I would never say anything and I would not judge you for it. I said, I love my church folks. Not all of them, just a couple of them I might need to complain about from time to time. (laughs) We all need that. Isn't it better for me to take my problems to a professional, godly, ordained minister who happens to also be a licensed counselor than for me to take it to someone else in the church? That's what we do. We, we get emotionally burnt out, and then we gossip to people who don't have no business knowing what we're talking about. Because we're too prideful, and we think we have it too much that, to, to talk to someone who, who actually is a professional. No one wants to say amen just yet. And last but not least, sometimes we need creative rest. That's Becca probably too. When you always have to be creative, coming up with sermon series graphics and working your 500. This is, if you need a picture of a millennial, this is it right here. 500 side jobs, full-time jobs, super creative. My professor couldn't help me figure out how to like put uh, numbers on this weird Turabian formatted paper. I called Becca on FaceTime and within three no, within one minute, 30 seconds, she showed me how to do it. This girl is so creative and so tech savvy and knows all this stuff that she probably sometimes need a creative 
break. And so if you're constantly, um, you know, being creative, the thing, sometimes a creative break for you might to be go out in nature. See God's creation. Because, honey, I don't care how creative you are, you can't make a tree. <laughs> I mean, you could put a seed into a ground and grow a tree, but you can't make a tree, right? Like there's something about being out in nature that will help us find that rest. So with these things, the reason I'm saying this is because this is my question for you. How do you fill your tank when you feel empty? Because sometimes beep, 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 I'm going to Josh thinking I need uh, an emotional release or a spiritual release or just whatever, and it's really, I need to go up, pray. I really need to get some sleep. I really need to go clean my house and find rest that way. I really need to go in nature and go for a walk, right? Sometimes we're going to other people or other things trying to get rest, and it's not meeting our need because it's not the kind of rest we need. Can someone say amen? Did you hear that? Find out what kind of tired you are so you can find out what kind of rest you need. Amen? And friends, the, the fourth focus here is others' focus. This is Barnabas. So Barnabas was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was others' focus. I already told you there would have been a, no Paul if there was no Barnabas. Acts 9, 27 says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, talking about Paul, and declared unto him how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and that how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Paul got saved. But if you remember, Paul used to be Saul and Saul was persecuting the church. And when Paul got saved, the disciples were afraid of him. They were like, OK, I'm cool. I'm going to hold Paul at arm's length. And Barnabas came around Paul and said, man, I see what God is doing in your life. I heard you preach. Come with me, buddy. I'll introduce you to the apostles. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need someone in our life to say, I don't care that no one else sees what God is doing in your life. I see what God is doing. Come with me. Let's do this thing together. That's what Barnabas was. He was others focused. He saw in others what no one else could see. Can you imagine? What if Barnabas never went to Paul? Maybe God, I'm sure, could have used somebody, but God chose Barnabas to go to Paul to raise him up and to use him, to change him into the apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. How amazing is that? My question to you is, is your natural disposition that of a defender? Or that of a persecutor? Are you going to be one who would defend someone else and say, no, that's who they used to be before Christ, but Christ has changed and this is who they are now? Or are you one who would agree with the accuser of the brethren and, and, and speak evil over somebody else? What is your natural disposition? Because some of us have a natural thing. Some of us, naturally, we're just open. And some of us, naturally, I'm talking fleshly, we're closed off. And we have to be careful that we don't carry our natural into the supernatural with us. That we allow God to do what God wants to do. And that's what Paul, uh, Paul had in Barnabas. So not only did Barnabas bring him into the apostles, but then after he, was, he brought Paul to the apostles with them, the apostles sent Barnabas and Paul to Antioch. We see this in Acts 15. It says, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, and many others also. Barnabas was the spiritual leader in the church of Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. If you ever did uh, a Symbol of God Bible quiz when you was a kid, one of the questions is, where's the first place that people were called Christians? Because before Antioch, they were, Christians were called the way. But in Antioch, they start calling them Christians, Christ little Christ, little followers of Christ. And it was Barnabas who was the first leader of the church in Antioch, and then, of course, Paul. And this is some of the things that we see from the scriptures about the characteristics of the church of Antioch. We see that they were encouragers, that they had encouragement. Where do you think they learned that from? They learned that from Barnabas. They, were, they, they had the character of encouragement. They had prayer that was heavy and strong in the church in Antioch. They had fasting, giving, and developing disciples. Again, all this characteristics from 
Barnabas. So friends, if we want to have the book of Acts kind of revival, then we must have the book of Acts kind of habit. If we want to have the book of Acts kind of revival, we need to develop that kind of habit. We need to be encouragers. We need to be givers. We need to fast and to pray. We need to do these things. We need to develop disciples. Come on, friends. We need to be others focused. So my question for you, if you just listening to those disciplines, and there's so many other Christian disciplines, what are three spiritual practices that you actually exercise daily? Do you pray? Do you get into your word? Do you journal? Do you listen to worship? Do you encourage other people? Do you bring comfort to other people? What are some spiritual practices that you do daily? Because this is, this is what changes us. This is what makes us different. And here we are, last thing that I want us to focus on that we can learn from Barnabas. So he was others-focused, but you know what else he was focused on? Potential. He was focused on others' potential. First, we see he was focused on Paul's potential because no one else believed in Paul. They're like, hmm, I'm not sure about him. And then we see that not only would there be no Paul without Barnabas, but there would be no John Mark. Mark was, have you ever heard of the Gospel of Mark? Okay. The Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was a, a powerful short gospel that uh, a lot of people believe it was John Mark who penned it, but it was from the perspective of Peter. There would not have been a gospel of Mark, friends, if there was not a Barnabas in Mark's life. And let me show this to you. In, in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are on their second missionary journey. And it says, and the uh, and there was a contention, a sharp contention, so sharp that between Paul and Barnabas, that they departed from one another. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. This is the thing. Um, Mark basically bailed on Paul, and Paul was like, no, I'm good. I'm not taking with him on my next missionary journey. And Barnabas said, man, Give them one more chance. There's, you know, give them one more chance. And there was a great di division. I actually wrote a blog about this one time. There was a great division between Barnabas and Paul. And you would think to yourself, man, Paul? I mean, I know we don't ever want to question Paul, but you realize he's not like the fourth part of the Trinity. He, he was a human. He made mistakes, right? And sometimes we're like, man, Paul, I think, can, did you forget what Barnabas did to you? Jonas, you got to move up with your dad. I can't take it anymore. Move up with your dad. This is not kids' church, okay? Move up to your dad, please. Thank you. And so here it is. He's looking at, he's looking at them, and he's, and, and he's like, I cannot take Mark with me. This is Paul. I cannot take Mark with me. And instead, he's, he, he's, he, Barnabas stood up for him. He said, you know what? I'm taking him with me. And I say that I believe that Barnabas was right in this situation. Now, God moved on the behalf of both of them because Paul took Silas, and they went on a missionary journey, and they did awesome things, and Barnabas took Mark, and Mark ended up writing the, the gospel of Mark from Peter's perspective. Now, the other reason I believe that Paul was wrong is because later on we see in the gospels, and I'm sorry I didn't write this scripture down, but you can look it up. Uh, later on we, we see in the New Testament, not in the gospels, the New Testament, that Paul at the end of his life said, hey, I am here alone, only Luke is with me. Get Mark to come to me. And this is when he was in prison. Get Mark to come to me. So that shows that he then saw a change in Mark. He would not have seen that change in Mark if it was not Barnabas saying, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm still going to pour into you. I see potential. And this is the thing. We have to see potential in people. We cannot give up on people, even when they mess up, even when they, they fail, even when they're uh, not doing what they should do. We have to continue to see potential in our young people. Even when we have to correct them, we have to still see the potential. In our children, in, in our brothers and sisters in the Lord, where is the potential that you see? Friends, oftentimes we think of an encourager as someone who is weak. But I think it took a lot of guts to stand up to the Apostle Paul with his personality. And Barnabas stood up to him. He said, no, I'm taking Mark with me. There's still potential there. And friends, I want to present to you today 
being an encourager is not being a pushover. It's not being someone who is weak. It is being someone who sees potential in other people. God has called us to be encouragers. So in conclusion today, I want to present a couple things to you. Are you spending time inspiring others, encouraging others? It does not cost anything, but it can change someone's life. So what I want to encourage you to do today is find a way, whether it's taking a note card and sending encouragement, to encourage somebody in this body. Maybe it's a teenager that's really getting on your nerves today. <laughs> Maybe it's a young adult. Maybe it's an older saint that feels like God doesn't have much left for them, and you need to encourage them today. Find someone to encourage today. Send a text. Get on a social media Better yet, if you can call them up or meet them face-to-face even before they leave here today, speak an encouraging word over them. And then I want to encourage you to to ask, Lord, how how can I be encouraging with my time, with my treasure, and with my talent? What can I do to be a giver in that way like Barnabas was? And how can I tell other people about Jesus? That's what Barnabas did. He, he, that, that church in Antioch, that's when they all became Christians. Would you stand up to your feet with me, please? Why don't you go ahead and close your eyes, bow your head. Let's not be distracted by anyone behind us or in front of us. If this word spoke to you today and you know you need to encourage others, would you just raise your hand before the Lord? Father God, with those with their hands lifted before you, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you moved on their heart today, that they that they know that they needed to step out and to encourage others. God, I pray, Lord God, that they would that they would give what they have, that they first would make sure that they are encouraged in the Lord, that you are filling them up, Lord, that they pour out what they have in you. And God, I pray, Lord God, that you would find them ways to to show kindness to others, to encourage one another, to uplift one another. God, I pray, Lord God, that you would help your people reflect your character to the world. God, help us remember that picture of that iceberg. Sometimes when people say that they're fine, that's just a surface answer because deep down, the pain is too much to, to bring up in a quick conversation. Help us go deeper in our relationships with one another. Help us give to one another. God, show us what is our time. What are we doing with our time, our our treasure, our talent, Lord Jesus? How are we using it to advance your kingdom? Lord, help us all walk a little bit more like Barnabas. Help us all be a little bit more encouraging to one another. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. If you need any special prayer, we'd be glad to pray for you.